Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Shooting Show. I'm here on the top of our bank with lovely views over the small village of Hayes in Norfolk. But first we join Chris Parkin as he's out after a cockerel killing culprit. And then we head over to East Anglia where we join Richard Negus and Richard Gould. The pair are hoping to cull a number of roebuck and muntjac to help restore the biodiversity on a local farm. Hello, my name is Richard Negus and I am currently driving uh, to a farm in Mid Suffolk to meet my friend and business partner Richard Gould and he is currently undertaking a roebuck cull. He is an expert on deer, 30 years as a gamekeeper, he now lays hedges with me. Before we even got here today Richard had already shot four because he's a good shot, he knows the lie of the land and we've already ascertained as to where these deer are. So these are four off to his chiller and then they'll go off to the game dealer. After that he's going to go off again and try and mop up a few more because we know how many we need to kill here and this is about a quarter of the way through the target. So I drive up the the route that you and I drove last time I drove basically around that I saw a deer where we shot the first group the other day there was a deer to the right there straight away and I couldn't shoot it because it ran back towards the houses I thought it was going to go through the hedge and give me the chance on the next field and I was sort of driving along looking at that and not taking any notice of where I was going and as I come through the gateway there's one stood out in the field right in front of me that I could have shot if I'd have been awake. That went over the crest of the hill, so I drove around the edge of the field, looking to my left, keeping half an eye out for that, hoping I was going to still see it out in the field where there was a safe shot. Drove right on top of another one that was laying in the grass margin that was a safe shot. And the one that I was watching went through the hedge, through the boundary, and then stood on somebody else's field and looked at me beautifully and would have given me a shot if they owned that field. Those three deer were all within 250 metres of each other. I've now shot four in this spot and those four from the one that I shot the furthest one was in that gap in that hedge over there but I shot it from the other side back this way and those three were in a group down there so I, I've shot four 200 meters apart here goes to show too many isn't it? yeah mm. yeah and there were, there were there were four here and I shot three of them I let one yeah. go back through here the better one yeah. Yeah. Did that look like it went in the brambles? Did that look like that had moved, that moved when I shot it? I thought I heard a bullet swag, but I definitely saw it turn and go. But there's no... I'm pretty sure it was stood right there. It also looked as it went in, it went up a bit. So I found some blood. It's red, it's proper heart blood, so it's going to be dead. This is man of a serious working dog. Oh. Um, I suspect it's gone right through where you're stood. There's a spot of blood there, and there's a spot of blood there where it's gone from there I don't know. I think there's no way of getting a deer out there and I think the deer's good a few times getting a dog hurt.
Okay, so we found the muntjac earlier on, right underneath the bottom of the brambles in the bottom of the scrap iron heap. So we've left Richard Negus there with his bill hook cutting his way into it. We're going to go and pick him and the muntjac up in five minutes time. I just wanted to nip down here because we knew we'd find a deer in this hedge. Um, it's quite important to shoot the deer along this hedge because it's one of the ones we're going to coppice and do some laying on later on. It's very hard to shoot deer here because we've got the village up to the left and we've got a footpath across to the right. So the only real way you can shoot the deer is straight down this line here. As luck would have it, we came around the corner, found the, this buck exactly where we expected to find him and shot him straight away. He might be a bit closer to the motor, so I can hang him on this little bush. Now this farm, over 360 acres, has got 58 kilometres of hedgerow. We've walked every single mile of them doing our hedgerow management plan. And nearly every hedge has got this problem to it, eaten out the bottom. Your grey partridge wants the nest in this tussock grass here. And behind, it wants a thick hedge that's going to act as a barrier for the wind. And that's also going to be somewhere that it can escape to, to escape from raptors. So essentially what's happened is the deer has eaten out the understory of this hedge and you can see a mouse run through it now. Deer are actually hampering grey partridge conservation. Now that's the truth is the same for many other species of bird and mammal. This hedge is not as good as it could and should be courtesy of deer browsing. This is a hedge that we've got slated to lay next winter and if we do lay that all the regrowth, when that thickens up back at the base again, is going to get eaten away. So, economically speaking, that's no good thing either. I would have loved to have been able to shoot that muntjac there, but I'm not certain what's behind this hedge, and I'm 99% sure it's somebody's house, so we're not going to shoot that. He's just wandered into there, I would imagine. He's probably not very far in that cover now. I wouldn't be surprised if he stood in there looking at us as we drive past. You know, that was not a safe shot. <laughs> We've gone through that hedge. Oh, how am I going to get to there? One of those was definitely a buck. Oh, you good lads. It's boundary hedge. They are to the left. Yeah, that in our break. They're not a safe shot because they're on the horizon and that is out of bounds. Oh, right on the, it's on the grass, not on the crop. I oh, see it yet. Yeah. I just think even if we got right round the other end of this hedge and tried to come at it, it's, um, I'm not sure if I can drive down the next, Edge. If it's got a margin on the back, I can get down. You can't have 110% confidence you're going to hit something because everybody misses, so you've got to know that there's something behind it other than thin air to, to stop that bullet. Right. New plan. If we go back to the farmyard where your car is, we can walk up the back there because there's going to be no way of being able to shoot them in a safe way. So if we go back old school, park in the yard and go for a walk, we can possibly drill them and then go to the end of the next hedge and try to go down after that roadbuck we've seen. I actually shot where those muntjac are. Last time I came onto this farm, there's a pair of muntjac out there and I did the stalk that we're now about to do. And by the time I got there, there was only one, not two. I don't know where the other one went, but I managed to shoot that. Okay, so we've just seen two muntjac. We couldn't shoot them from where they were because they weren't safe. So we've come and parked up we can stalk up this hedge and if they're still where we think they're going to be they're just behind that big oak tree and behind the hedge so this is a stalk i've done before basically just creep up here on the blind side creep around the corner and you've got a safe shot off sticks at relatively close range to shoot the muntjac okay let's go Moved off a bit. I 
I'm not confident shooting off the sticks at that range, so I'm going to try and just see if they'll let me get onto this high ground and lay down and shoot off the bike top. I hope you've got that all on film. <laughs> okay, so we know there's a road bark on the next hedge over. I don't think he'll have moved um, because there's a lot of footpaths through here and they're used to seeing people wandering about. So. We'll walk out and make sure that the Munjack are dead and then we'll come back round keeping the village and the road to our right so that we can get right for wind and right for a safe shot and see if we can get this road back as well. Be a nice end to the day. There are Munjack dead quite close to the farmer's garden. He hates Munjack in the garden. Um, about 180, 190 with the new rifle, so I'm feeling a little bit happy about that. We saw a roebuck earlier on on the side of the hedge. We're now gonna try and creep round behind that. So we're shooting away from the village. I'm just not sure. I think we were all right where we shot the Munjack from, but the wind is basically blowing from us to it now. So I'm quite keen to get away from it. It might've already gone, but we're gonna have a look. We expect this roebuck to be about there. Um, we're going to go to this end of the hedge, look down the back of the hedge and make sure he's still there. If he is, I'm planning on creeping down this side of the hedge, through the hedge just near the big oak tree where the gap is, and try and shoot him without him even moving. Got 10 yards short at the end of the hedge and two roebucks have come out of this wood onto the field that we've, we've spooked, we didn't know they were there. Um, I've quickly got to the gate where one stopped out there about 200 yards and I was had it in the sights and was just thinking of a shot and it moved again and it's, it's too far after that. The other one didn't even give that much of an opportunity. The deer that we actually come after that we knew was laying on the back of the hedge isn't here anymore so I can only assume that in the time it took us to get round it's moved into the wood and was one of the two that we've just seen. Yeah, time to time to grab them and head off home. Aim for tea and medals. I'm not sure what this one's going to... This one's been fighting, look. Breaking antlers and scout. I don't know whether it's been fighting with us. I mean, slid down the road by a car. So final tally, five roebucks and a pair of muntjac. Total seven, all off of about less than 100 acres. Thank you for watching the shooting show. We hope you've enjoyed this episode and look forward to seeing you next week. A good haul from the guys there and we look forward to seeing the impact of their efforts very soon. But now we join Chris Parkin as he has a problem fox in his sight. Armed with some of the latest kit from Mauser and Pard, Chris has to identify the culprit and let's see how he gets on. Hello, I'm Chris Parkin and I'm out tonight with the latest Mauser M18 Fenris in 6.5 Creedmoor. I'm using RWS 93 grain non-toxic ammunition, a Wildcat moderator and on top we've got a PAR DS3570 night vision rifle scope with a PBIR illuminator on top. Welcome to the shooting show. The call tonight is to tackle a fox that has taken a prized cockerel from its own personal chicken coop. Whichever fox did it has some creative climbing skills as it has gone in over the top of an eight foot tall wire fence. 
The carcass was found earlier this morning about 200 metres away, picked clean, so the fox has clearly carried it all the way back to make sure it got a good meal from it. As usual, this land has a few hairs on it. We weren't shooting these tonight though, but it's always a good opportunity to check scope and illuminator settings. I was fascinated watching this owl and distracted from the fact a fox walked in about 90 metres away from us while we were talking quietly early in the evening. There are a lot of pampered foxes around here and rarely that wily, but it did immediately scare the hare that was close by and it chased that off to the top of the field. Fenris is the latest model in the Mauser M18 range. It uses the GRS Fenris stock, which is named after the mythological Norse wolf. It has adjustable cheek piece and length of pull for a precise fit, but is asymmetric and currently available in right hand only. I adjust the position and point of aim onto the fox immediately and tracked it. Gentle squeaks, whistles and a shout weren't having much effect on it as it had its sight set on the hare it had chased up the hill from the position where it had first surprised both of us. It paused at the fence and I shot but missed. A quick glimpse through the thermal showed it had turned 180 degrees and sauntered back down the field without any particular haste. I particularly like the stock's rigidity, there is no point of impact shift when swapping between quad sticks, prone or a tripod rest. The rifle is heavy and ultra stable for longer range precision shooting requirements, although it's not too heavy to go hunting with. Although the Creedmoor is noisier than a 223 and the bullet struck firm backstop close by, it didn't seem that agitated. I made a better shot the second time and got a clean kill through the chest. The second fox was a more unusual local example just a few minutes later. It entered the adjacent field close to a footpath which precluded a shot. The fox was totally unresponsive to any calls, good or bad, positive or negative, and it just carried on sauntered around doing what it was doing. It was steadily working up the field in the direction of a safer background and also very slowly approaching my position too. I saw no point in pursuing it or rushing and decided to let it go and see what happened. Although the shot was getting longer with every step the fox took, the wind conditions were favourable and the rifle had plentiful energy and accuracy for a longer shot. One of the reasons I wanted to be absolutely sure of background without excessive cover as well as backstop was that I was using heavy 93 grain non-toxic bullets running at 3250 feet per second. Unlike a varmint bullet these were likely to pass clean through the fox so I was also accounting for ricochet risk off the grass from this low angle shot. The part has a laser rangefinder and ballistic compensation for longer range trajectory, so I wasn't really concerned about the distance of the shot so much as being cautious about making sure I didn't ping any barbed wire, gives return signal on the laser rangefinder on a couple of occasions. This one is in 6.5 Creedmoor, but it's also available in 223, 243, 270, 6.555, 6.5 PRC, 308, 3006 and 300 Win Mag, as well as a few other European favourites. It's 24 inches or 610 millimeters long, so you get good velocities from any ammunition used. The action has a three lug, 60 degree lift bolt, and ammunition is fed from a 10 round detachable magazine smoothly. 
The trigger is weight adjustable from 1000 to 2000 grams and ejection from the action is very reliable. Overall length is 1110mm or 43.5 inches. Weight is 4.4 kilograms or £9.12 ounces. The retail price is £1,499. The 93 grain non-toxic Evo Green ammunition I'm using from RWS is developing at 3,250 feet per second, which does give a very flat trajectory and is hard hitting at longer distances too. 15 minutes after its first appearance, the Fox presented a safe shot and I took it for a clean kill. The rain had set in so I went to retrieve the foxes. Both were vixens weighing 8 and 9 kilograms respectively. They were both in good condition with excellent teeth so I immediately suspected they were being fed by unhelpful neighbours as well as the fact they were clearly eating the local chicken population when they got the chance. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that night out foxing with a new Mauser Fenris and 6.5 Creedmoor. It's a little bit larger than the sort of guns I'm normally using for foxing, but as it turned out, where we often shoot foxes 120, 150 metres maximum, we actually shot some at 165 and 190 tonight, so it really worked out nicely. And the 93 grain non-toxic ammunition from RWS did actually work better than I expected. I thought we might get pass-throughs with it, but actually it's done some quite good damage to bring the foxes down quickly and cleanly. In all honesty, I missed the first fox with the first shot. I just wasn't stable, obviously, and I missed it, but I did follow it up with another quick shot just as it moved on. Strangely, it ran towards us, not away from us. And unusually tonight, on this piece of land where the foxes often respond very positively to some quite simple calls, tonight, one of them paid a little bit of attention but didn't really move around much. The second one paid no attention whatsoever and we were calling on it strongly for about 15 minutes. We often see foxes here which aren't really that wily, they're a little bit easy to shoot. These two were a little bit more wily and they certainly gave a little bit more of a struggle to get them tonight. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and click the notification bell to see the regular weekly uploads. Thanks for watching, bye for now. Sadly, that's all we've got time for on this episode of The Shooting Show. Make sure you like and subscribe for some more videos. And if you aren't a member of Basque, now's the time to join. My name's Chris Castle, and this has been The Shooting Show. If you aren't a member of Basque, it's time to join now. Basque, looking after your sport, looking after you.